First of all, from Jeremiah, uh, chapter 31, beginning at verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was their husband, said the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And then from Hebrews, chapter, 20, chapter 12, beginning at verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to a judge who is God of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks more graciously than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. <laughs> And then from St. John, chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that bears no fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he proves that it may bear more fruit. You are already made clean. By the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If a man does not abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Every year I come to um, say something at a covenant service, I find I, s I look back, I've said the same thing every year. It's interesting actually, I remember somebody saying in a, in a, in a big meeting once, that he was a big preacher, you know, preaching serious congregations and he had that feeling that when he'd said it once he really ought to say something else but he realised that he needed to go on saying it until everybody took it on board or had forgot, forgotten it and uh, so I want to say just very briefly something um, which has got to be said every year and I've got to say it every year because I need to say it to myself um, because for the life of me the covenant is always sounding like a recommitment service at the beginning of a new year. Partly because Wesley's um, adaptation of this ancient service is, um, is full of put me to this, that and the other. And it looks like a recommitment, doesn't it? It, 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 is, it is a whole list of all these things I'm going to do or I'm going to try and do or I hope I'm going to do. Put me to this and put me to that and... Put me to everything else. And it's not easy. 
but it is an awful lot to do with me. I, I remember when we went to uh, Nottingham first, we found that the church was not using this covenant service. They were using another one. And I said, well, why are you using another one? They said, we wanted something that was, he won't believe it, easier. <laughs> Wouldn't we all like an easier service? And after all, this is not the Bible. It's that Wesley made it up from, a, from a, an, earlier, an earlier service. But it's not easy. And the fact that it's difficult and challenging, and it's all about what I'm going to do and what you're going to do, instinctively makes me feel it's a recommitment service. And it wouldn't hurt if it was, would it? We'll all get together, beginning of a new year. Some of you used to meet in September when Methodist years began in September. We began a new year, we recommit ourselves. That wouldn't be bad if, if it wasn't a covenant service. And in fact, the new year bit of it makes it worse. Let's, you know, it sort of fits on a sort of spiritual version of New Year's resolutions, isn't it? You know? And sometimes it's just about as effective as they are. What I have to say every year to myself is that primarily the covenant is not about what I do, but what God does. As you read these passages from the Old and the New Testament, we are a covenant people, not because we've all come together and we've decided we'll join, but because God for some reason has chosen us when he might not have. In the Old Testament, God comes and says, um, and you will be, I will be your God and you will be my people. I often sometimes feel Israel looking up there and saying, really? <laughs> because it's a bit like that. God comes in sovereignty and he says, you will be my people and I will be your God. And brackets, you will keep my laws. So there is that sense of sovereignty and choosing. But of course for them, they see it as a huge privilege, as a, as a rather small nation amongst many nations and, uh, uh, who didn't have anything special at all and God speaking to them and choosing them. I think if I can come this afternoon with an overwhelming thought that I have been chosen, that God for some good reason, I don't know why, decided that he would make me his child and you the same then I come with a degree of gratitude rather than a, I'm come to volunteer. And in the New Testament, the idea of covenant is more subtle. I suspect that John 3.16 does as good as anything for the New Testament covenant, really. And God so loved the world that he sent his only son, all that he does, so that who believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the new covenant in Hebrews, really the blood that is better than Abel's. But in both, he chooses to come. We have, we have just celebrated Christmas, and I, expect, I expect, said to many of you at some time or another through one carol service or another, let us always remember that although we seem to have Christmas every year, it is not automatic. God did not need to send his son unless he wanted to save us. God chose to send his son have his own volition, not to bin us and give up on us, but to rescue us. And so the real thrust of this is that whatever I do here is a response. These responses are interesting because they look big to us, but in the big scheme of things, they're quite small. It's a bit like that in the bleak midwinter, isn't it? What shall I give him, poor as I am? If I was a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. But if you're a shepherd, a lamb's a big deal. If you're running the universe, a lamb is not a big deal. And so our commitment is big because it's all of us and God values it. But in relation to what he's done for us on the cross, it's nothing. Turning out for a second service in the middle of the afternoon is a degree of commitment from all of us. But God's commitment to us by turning up this afternoon is infinitely more. It is a matter of response. I say that every year. I wonder why I find it so difficult to hold that in my mind. <laughs> the doctrine is there, but so much of my Christian commitment is running around working for God that recommitment seems to be what I do. Now, the traditional way of looking at this is that Methodists are real doers. Methodists, on the whole, are Martha's rather than Mary's. 
We like committees, we like coffee mornings, we like doing things, we like being busy, and indeed we celebrate any new phase of Methodism by having another lot of church councils, synods, circuit meetings, and other jolly gatherings. You know, let's start again, let's get busy, you know, September, start again, get busy, New Year, start again, get busy, you know. But I don't know, this idea that somehow we we are taken up with commitment, I'm not sure that's true, I mean, I'm reasonably committed. Some of you would say, you know, with your job you're paid to be committed, but, you know, sorry, paid to go to committees, but we are overwhelmed with enthusiasm It's not that I I forget God's covenant to me because I'm so busy serving him. We do our bit. But you look at the great men and women of old, the saints. You look at the, the missionaries and the people who do really difficult things today. Their enthusiasm exhausts me. I'm fairly part time, really. I cannot say that I'm so busy working for Jesus that it overwhelms my idea that he has chosen me. So I've got plenty of time to think that if I only would. I, I think it might be more that we come and we make the covenant, we read the Bible readings and we say that is true, that is doctrine, that is true. But it lacks substance. What we do has substance. I do it, I go there, I'm blood, sweat and tears. But God, God has chosen me in theory. God chooses me and I stick it on the wall. I remember, um, you know, you, you get all sorts, you like go in, in all sorts of government buildings, you used to go in and there's a big crest on the wall which says sort of the queen runs this. But she doesn't do much really. And so it is very often, we stick a cross on the wall. This is all God's doing, but we seem to be doing most of it. I lack substance. There has been a secularization in our Christianity. We believe in Jesus. We work for Jesus. But when I say something like, I am no longer my own but yours, I understand a lot more about what it means to be me than I do about him. It's a different substance. It's a doctrinal thing. I think that's why I find it difficult to hang on to the the emphasis of all God has done. because Not because I'm super busy, but because it's more tangible what I do than what he does. And so funny enough, at Covenant, we come to reaffirm that we are not to be secularised as a religious institution, but that we are chosen by a God who does and acts and is, and to re-establish our sense of his reality. There's going to be plenty of reality in what we've got to do in the next few months the meetings you'll go to, the people you will visit, the money you will give, the prayers you will pray, the Bible readings you will read. We know all that. But what God does has to be at least, and in fact should be more solid than that. I am no longer my own, but yours. And yours needs to be just as solid as I. Otherwise I lose touch with yours and I hang on to I and I run around. And if I, if I say, Holy Spirit, we pray this, this afternoon in our covenant that you would, you would reaffirm us with your spirit. Not that I know that I have been chosen, but I know you who chooses me. Then I have that tangible basis that motivates me with thanksgiving, not just duty, but real thanksgiving, Really thank you, Lord. And I also, of course, as you see from John's Gospel there, have the Lord's actions in my life as the, as the, the things that I hang all my actions on. If we abide in him, we will bear much fruit, but the fruit of the fruit of the Spirit. So I have a tangible thing. God is and God acts, and I am and I act right. And so rather than just concentrating on what I'm going to do, I need this positive sense of what God does. Not just in my doctrinal, historical belief system, but in the way I really think. That God is amongst us more solid than you and I are. 
But I just say one more thing. This struck me this year particularly. We need a, a present experience of Jesus to drive this stuff. But it's no good just saying, Jesus is here, thank you Lord, and then rushing off as a response. Let's take him with this, um, I am no longer my own but yours, put me to what you will, rank me with whom you will, put me to doing, put me to suffering, let me be employed for you and laid aside for you, exalted for you, brought low for you, let me be full, let me be empty. How do I know what this is? How do I know what he will put me to? How do I know whether I'm supposed to be empty or full or active or laid aside? How do I know whether I'm supposed to be doing things I like anyway or things that are difficult? How do I know? Put me to this. How do I know? I've got to listen, surely. In that passage from Hebrews, it said here that the blood of Abel speaks. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Between the I experience the presence of the living God and I rush off to do my discipleship, there has to be some listening. And ironically then, rather than kick-starting a new year's of activity, we need to have a degree of be still and know that I am God at Covenant or you won't know what to do. How many of us have gone out to activities with our small children or our even smaller grandchildren and they're so excited they rush off before you've told them what's happening? You know? They don't go there, you don't know what you're going to do yet, do you? You know? Well, I, I have that with my grandchildren all the time anyway. You know? They're so excited, they, they, they love it, you know, and they don't know what they're doing. Just come here. No, I want to go. Let's come here. You know? And that needs to be the case with God. Put me to what you will, and I'll go and do it before you've told me. <laughs> you know? Some bit of quiet. So that perhaps we've got some of the Mary in us rather than the Martha. And then Mary's told to go and help with the washing up. You know? But at least she's told. At the end of the day, to sum up, what I'm saying is, this covenant is about God, not about us. But he chooses each one of us. And at the end of the day, my response to John 3.16 is only yes. Would you be in on this? Do you believe this? Do you trust in Jesus? My response is yes. Just yes. <laughs> but I need to listen. Because I need to then say, yes what? <laughs> yes what? And as churches and as individuals, we need to be a listening people. Before we are an acting people. Listening to a real Lord who says real things, who dominates our lives and our church life, dominates our situation, for whom this response is natural, good, healthy, motivated. But it is a response. <laughs>